Okay, we're recording now. Um, so it's gonna be a relatively basic presentation. It's a 100 level class. Hopefully that's not going to be too hard for you all. It's gonna be a pretty simple presentation. Uh, this is something that we're offering. Um, let me go through here. Uh, we're gonna be offering this class uh, in cooperation with the Animus Valley Grange <clears throat> up the valley. And it's part of their educational series. I know with the Grange you can get online. They do have a Facebook site, so you can go on to their Facebook site and see what else they have offered uh, throughout the series, uh, the season. But they do a great job in getting some stuff out um, to a lot of people out there, and it's really, really interesting. Some of the presentations they they give out. So, um, and I should say I am giving this talk from um, our office room, so. There is a chance you will hear a child. There's a chance you'll hear a dog bark. There's a chance you'll hear a child scream or my wife scream at a child. Um, that's kind of the nature of the beast with Zoom these days and especially at 6.30 at night. So um, if you hear those things, uh, know that our house is a house and that's kind of like everybody else out there. So some of the overview questions, and again, I can't see all of you, I can only see a few of you, but we do, you know, just to think about some of these things. And these are questions that I ask anybody, and, you know, my master gardeners have seen the same, these same questions and people who have come to talks and people who have come into my office. But how many of you, you know, think about it, how, do you consider yourself a, a beginner vegetable gardener? Is this something that you... Um, are just starting to get into? Is it something that maybe as this pandemic has kind of created you to think more about growing your own food? Um, or some of you have been doing this for a long time. How many of you are, are native to Colorado or lived in the area where you now live for, you know, 15 years, right? So, and it's not to be prejudiced against Californians or upper Midwesterns or Texans. It's just because our challenge here is we live in a high desert, right? And we're kind of gonna go through climate and some of those challenges that we see with climate. Um, but again, it's, you know, at, at 6,500 feet at Durango, um, give or take a, a couple thousand or more on the upside, and then we go down to about 5,500 close to the state line. Uh, it's a challenging environment to grow vegetables. Uh, how many of you have space for, let's say just a 15 foot by 15 foot garden? And again, those are, it's kind of a, it, it's not a specific number. It's not a, a number that you have to have. But when we think about that 15 by 15 garden, to me, that's something that can provide food for you and your family um, and probably a couple neighbors or give some away. And, and again, so how many of you will have a garden this year, right? Like how many of you are going to be gardening in 2020? <clears throat> Hopefully a lot of you, hopefully this will help some of you get to that next point of, of wanting to start a garden. Um, and now, you know, our, one of our hopes with anything CSU Extension does is that we, we get rid of this fear of the green thumb, right? Like you have to have a green thumb to be able to garden. Um, when I teach the Master Gardener class, one of the things that people worry about is they, they can't get into the Master Gardener class because they don't, they don't think they have a green thumb. Um, and one of our biggest hopes is that we can change a black thumb to a green thumb, right? So that's kind of one of our hopes is that, you know, you, you don't have to be intimidated by this gardening process. And then we think about some of our goals. And, and I really want to kind of drill these in. And, and, and hopefully some of you can, can think about why you want to garden. You know, what is out there for you that makes you want to say, I really want to do this? Um, because you're going to have to maximize your time. You know, we are all incredibly busy. Um, I would say now we're going to have a little more time on our hands than at other times of the year. Uh, we probably weren't expecting to have a lot of time on our hands as, on our hands as gardeners. Um, you know, this, uh, at this point in the season, you know, March, April, May tend to be pretty busy seasons for us gardeners. So it's kind of, um, interesting to be able to go in this, um, and, you know, and, and, and not fully know what we're getting into, but um, we'll still grow plants, right? They'll still grow regardless of what's going on, but we want to maximize our time. Our time is valuable. We want to produce nutritious food. 
you know, there's a fair number of studies out there that say the most nutritious food is, is, you know, is the food that's harvested within 48, is eaten within 48 hours of harvest, right? So that's why many of our local producers that you could buy food from, you know, at our grocery stores, at our farmer's markets through CSAs, they're harvesting on a Friday for a market on a Saturday. And they, they do that because they're, they're harvesting it at their peak nutritional value. Um, Conversation and continued traditions. This is always a fun one for me. You know, this is, uh, you know, for me, I learned, you know, both my grandpas gardened and I wasn't like some 12 year old or 13 year old kid who couldn't wait to go out in the garden. You know, at 13, I couldn't wait to go play baseball or go hang out with my friends or, you know, learn this new Nintendo game that just came out, whatever it is. I, but I know that both my grandpas garden, one here in Durango, really just up the street from where I live in the Crestview neighborhood. Um, and then another, my grandpa and my mom's side lived in uh, Beulah, Colorado, so outside of Pueblo. So they're both uh, avid gardeners. They love their gardens. Um, like I think they've probably found their peace in their garden after a busy day. Uh, so potentially I'm continuing that tradition. And, you know, with the four kids I have here, hopefully one of those will continue the tradition that we do um, when it comes to a, a garden or, or the love of gardening. And it's also that conversation piece. Uh, we do this every time with my master gardener class. The first couple of classes, they don't really talk that much. But come, you know, the sixth or seventh class, they can't stop talking. And by the twelfth class, I've just given up. Um, they don't ever stop talking because it's about gardening. It's about something they love. <clears throat> so for us here, and how many are there? There's 91 people on this call. I'm, I'm betting the vast majority of you um, probably like to garden or you're excited about it. It's something that sounds fun. Um, you know, so again, it's that conversation and that tradition piece, which I really do get excited about. Space utilization. You know, we, we, we talk about that 15 foot by 15 foot garden in the backyard. That doesn't have to be everybody. Some folks have a back porch. Some folks have just like, you know, the back deck or a patio or something off their apartment. We want to try to utilize that space. We may want to be able to utilize some space inside to grow plants. So don't think that you have to have 40 acres. Don't think that you have to have all this land to grow food. <clears throat> Some of our goals are to teach people how you grow food in really small spaces. So we do have container gardening classes. We do have classes that teach people um, how to garden on small beds and small spaces. Um, and then there's just that environmental piece, right? It's that fresh air, you're getting out getting some exercise, and then the environmentally friendly piece kind of ties into food security as well. So all these things tend to interchange with each other with, um, you know, especially right now with COVID, where we look at food security, you know, it's good to know where our food comes from. I work every day with uh, a lot of producers here in the Southwest, and they're amazing producers, um, livestock producers, fruit and vegetable producers, um, but they're trying to make the make sure that the food that they get to you all is is secure. Make sure it's safe. Uh, make sure it's free from whatever's out there that could potentially harm you or them or whatever it is. Uh, so again, we look at that food security piece now in this time of a, a pandemic, where um, to me it feels good to know where my food came from. So how much should you grow, right? Like who knows how much you should grow? I, I, and I can't answer that question for you, but I can pose some questions back to you. How many mouths are you feeding? Is it just you? Is it you and a partner? Uh, is it a family? Does your family include teenagers? Um, right now my family includes three teenagers. Um, so we go through a lot of food and, and we go through a lot of vegetables. Uh, are you freeing a neighborhood, right? Are you part of a community garden? Um, are you, uh, growing a bunch of zucchini and finding open windows of cars and, um, sticking them on the driver's seat? So how much food, you know, how, depends on how many miles you're going to feed. What does my calendar look like this summer and fall? So again, if you're planning some trip in this year or any year, in the summer, a family reunion, a big trip with the kids, whatever it is, the camping trip in August, know that that, can, that garden and those weeds will continue to grow. They're not gonna stop for your vacation, your trip. Um, so continue to think about that. Think if you have that big, you know, that big event that comes in, again, July or August, maybe this isn't the best year to have the garden or you scale that garden down. Do you have help? 
you know, one of the biggest things that I fear is that people um, start to get upset with the garden. They don't want to go out into the garden. And then I get it. Like transplanting is fun. Thinning to me is awful. Um, weeding can be awful. Watering the garden with a glass of wine in your hand can be fun. So there's all these different things. Like, do you have help? So is it just you or are there people that are there to help you or, um, if you're smart, if you can trick your kids to help you to pay them a big fat nickel an hour. Do you have the ability to store food? You know, many of us um, are challenged in this case. We don't have a root cellar. I don't know how many people on this call, you know, have root cellars, but I'm guessing it's in the single digits. There's not a lot of people who had root cellars. However, I could tell you, I got, I'd ask that same question of, did your parents or grandparents have a root cellar in their house? And I, you know, my guess is that number then goes, goes up that you had that ability to store food as a kid. And we don't have that quite as much as we used to. The root cellar keeps it kind of at a consistent temperature. It does an amazing job with that, but it takes up space, you know, and sometimes that space is converted to basement bedrooms or a garage or whatever it is, but maybe you have, an unheated room downstairs. Maybe you have an insulated shed. Maybe you have an outbuilding that you feel like you could store stuff in for a while. So as long as it doesn't get below freezing and doesn't get probably above, you know, the ideal is if you can keep it below 55 degrees, then you'd be able to store some food uh, for a fair amount of time. It's not like storing in refrigeration. I doubt very many people have a walk-in refrigerator. Um, but that would be the ideal situation. But again, trying to grow food that you can store is also part of this process. Are you comfortable with food preservation? I think I saw our retired family consumer science agent, Wendy Rice, on here, and I, I would hope that she's comfortable. I know she's comfortable because she's taught thousands of people how to preserve food out there over the years. But are you comfortable with blanching and freezing food? Are you comfortable with uh, using a dehydrator? Um, what about a canner? Now I know that as I kind of go up this chain, few and fewer hands will be up um, because if I get to a pressure canner, my guess is very few of you know how to use a pressure canner or feel safe to use a pressure canner. canner. Um, I'm kind of in the eh on that one. No, anytime you include uh, glass and pressure and boiling water, I tend to have a little bit of a fear. Um, so again, it's one of these things that if you're comfortable with preservation, then you can grow a little bit more food um, um, to feed yourself, your family, whoever it is, longer in the season. And then do you have that ability to plant an extra row? This doesn't have to technically be an extra row. This could be um, an extra bed, an extra container, whatever it is. Um, and this, you know, and especially this year, this is one of those years where uh, I feel like this probably is going to hit home more than ever, where people are going to be food insecure. Um, and that's a fear in your community and in my community that our food insecure population is going to rise. Um, so are we able to grow some food and give it to a food bank, give it to Mana Soup Kitchen? Uh, share with our friends and neighbors, um, find those channels online, look through the Good Food Collective if you're in Durango or La Plata County or Southwest Colorado. Uh, the Good Food Collective does an amazing job um, getting fruit, food from point A to point B um, and making use of that food. So how do we do that efficiently and effectively can be a challenge, especially in times like this. Um, but again, if if you've ever had a fresh tomato, if you've ever had fresh lettuce or pulled a carrot out of the garden and washed it off and eaten it, you know why it's important to be able to share that food. Um, just because of the nutritional value and the taste component. You know, we've, we've had things at school gardens and, <coughs> excuse me, community gardens where people have never tasted fresh food or you think that they've never really tasted fresh food. You know, you get a kid to, who's scared to eat a tomato to pop a, a sun gold to cherry tomato in their mouth and to feel that explosion of sweetness throughout their mouth um, can change them. It can change them 
um, for a long time. And for us as gardeners and as valued community members, I feel like that's important. And then there's part of this too, is this victory garden. So the victory gardens are ones that, you know, we didn't uh, just decide to start here in 2020. You know, the victory gardens uh, were definitely a much more <coughs> um, a wartime plan back in 1918, I think it was. Um, a gentleman by the name of Charles Lathrop Park um, started, I, think, I don't remember the full name, maybe the National Garden uh, Commission um, to get people and to challenge people to grow food. Then they were trying to get people to grow their own food. So the food that's produced by our nation's farmers would go to our troops overseas. Now that doesn't seem to hold true today, um, but in both World War I and in World War II, they did this. In World War II, there was a resurgence of victory gardens where we saw the conversion of backyards, school playgrounds, vacant lots, um, church lawns, all those things were converted to food. Um, and to the point of by 1944, um, I believe there was, there was 20 million gardens that produced about 8 million tons of food. Um, so how about that? That's impressive. Um, and what we're trying to do today is just teach people and um, there's other folks out there trying to teach people how to just grow your own food um, and see what that's like. So the first thing, and I think probably most of you are from Colorado, is climate, right? And that's going to be a challenge. Um, our climate um, is not the most forgiving climate out there. It can be incredibly variable. We have all the, you know, these temperature swings, day and night temperature swings, which can be a challenge. And I don't know, I think this should come through. Some of these things are blocked off on my screen, um, but you can see those things that are highlighted. So Cortez, Durango, Pagosa just kind of highlighted them. Um, and what we look at is our length of our growing season. Okay, so this is the, you know, the probability of the first frost and the probability of that last frost. Um, let's just pick Durango. Uh, if we look at this, this is data that was collected um, for about 40 or 50 years up until about 2002. Um, and we see Durango, you know, on average, our last frost is May 25th. And on average, our first frost in the fall is September 22nd. That gives a growing season of about 120 days. Um, which, again, isn't that bad. Um, you can grow a lot in 120 days. You know, if you go a little bit east to Pagosa Springs, you're going to get down to 77 days. Um, and that's going to get a little bit more challenging. You know, you go up to Silverton, and I think they say they have nine days of a growing season in Silverton. And unfortunately, those nine days are not all in a row. Um, so it is a challenge to grow. Uh, I wish, you know, so one of these things that we'll talk about again, we'll probably in our presentation here as summer starts to close, is about season extension. So how we can get an extra week of our growing season or two weeks of our growing season can make the difference between a success and a failure. Here's the last, you know, 10 years. This is just Durango, 2009 to 2019. Um, and when people ask me, you know, when's the, gonna, the last frost or how long the growing season is, um, I, I, I just can probably make something up because really abnormal is the new normal. And you can see this variability throughout these last 10 years where we are seeing probably an increase in our growing season in general. Um, but we're also seeing, if you just look at those dates, you see a lot of variability in our last frost and in our first frost. Um, for those of you, uh, again, down here in Southwest Colorado in 2019, uh, look at that last frost date, right? That one was a killer. Um, June 23rd, uh, really late in the season. And then our first frost was September 22nd. So that gave us a growing season of 91 days. Um, <clears throat> a 90 day growing season can be a challenge for a lot of our crops. And if we look again, so here's just some of this data and it may be hard to read on your screen, especially those of you with a phone, <clears throat> but we did have a really cool spring. Um, our May and our June were, were relatively low temperatures. Um, and then again, we get the, a frost that's really on the first day of summer, second day of summer. Um, and it can be uh, pretty painful for folks. Um, and I should say, so I'm gonna do a, a quick timeout in that 
this is this is being recorded, hopefully. Um, so if I go through a slide too quickly, if you want to get information, remember what I said, you had to take a phone call, whatever it is, we're going to post this on our website, which is laplatacountyextension.org. Uh, um, and we're also going to post it on the CSU website, which is grow and give colorado.org and i'll give you those slides at the end as well um, so we'll post this information again so you can see it all right but here's june 23rd in southwest colorado it was not a fun day um, those are potatoes on the left that were not happy uh, that was pretty much an entire field of potatoes that got tilled under uh, and if you look at the weather station data there, that's for Fort Lewis, Colorado. So that's our friends up at the old fort in Hesperus. Um, but yeah, when you see it, you know, uh, temperatures that are, are that cold with a wind, um, at 27 degrees, you're going to get crop damage, especially to our warm season crops, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. But our warm season crops get hammered with that. So again, it's not, but it's not just the cold temperatures in the spring and the fall. You know, our crops don't like these big changes in temperature. Uh, if I'm a tomato, I want my highs in the 80s and my lows in the 70s. Does that happen ever here outdoors? No, it doesn't, right? That's a pretty, pretty rare day if that's gonna ever happen. So some of these crops that we're growing in general just don't like our climate, but we continue to grow them. And I'm just as guilty. I will put tomatoes in my garden every year. I put peppers in my garden every year. Um, and I guarantee you come July or August, I am cursing my peppers and my tomatoes and the choice that I made to put those in the garden. So we also look at some of our crop selection. And, and this is the next piece in this. And to me, it's really simple. Just grow what you like to eat, right? Like if you like to eat certain things, then grow them. If your family likes to eat certain things, and grow it. Um, I've made the mistake, you know, I've planted kohlrabi, I planted um, um, some of our parsnips and turnips, just thinking that that would be a really cool crop to grow, but no one ate them. So why would I grow a crop that took up a quarter of my bed, my four by eight raised bed, or half of a four by eight raised, raised bed, and no one ate it. It just sat in the crisper until there was some bachelor night that I had that I'd be able to, you know, break out the rutabaga and, and, and have a, a party. So again, if you think about it, just think about what you like to eat in our house, kids will eat carrots, you know, kids, our kids will go through carrots. Like there's no tomorrow. Um, our kids will go through green beans. Like there's no tomorrow. Um, we go through a lot of our kale, our cold season crops. Um, so that's what we grow. Um, just because again, that's the stuff that we would buy. And so I'd rather grow it than buy it. What do you want to think about when it comes to some of the, these considerations? So if you have a raised bed or if you have three or four raised beds, how are you going to group those crops? And I want you to do this maybe now before you get out in that garden. This isn't something you, I would recommend that you don't do when you're standing in front of the raised beds with six seed packs in your hand and wondering what you're supposed to do. So just draw them out and then think about how you're going to group those beds and group those plants. Maybe you group by length of your growing period. So your days to harvest. So you can harvest the bed relatively at the same time. Group by cultural requirements. So if you have the water hungry crops like a beans, um, tomatoes, potatoes, maybe you group those together in one year and then you rotate them through. Um, because they can take a fair amount of water. Some of our crops don't need as much water. Um, and then also pest problems. <clears throat> pests tend to live in families. Um, so if you have a pest on your, uh, let's say you have early blight on tomatoes, there is a strong likelihood that that early blight will also go to peppers and it could go to potatoes. Um, so those are those crops that either we group them together and keep them separated out or, you know, we make sure that we don't allow those to contaminate each other. So maybe our tomatoes aren't near our peppers um, because we won't want that issue to hit our peppers, whatever it is. And allow for appropriate spacing. And we'll talk about spacing here a little bit later in the presentation. But, 
you do want to make sure you have good air circulation. You know, um, if you've ever grown squash, there's a good chance that you've had powdery mildew on your squash um, or downy mildew on your squash. And a lot of times it's just because those leaves create such a high relative humidity environment that the, there's more of a prone to uh, um, getting disease in there. And then, you know, and I do want to say, like, make sure you, when you read a seed catalog or a seed packet, they are trying to sell you on a product. You understand that, right? Like, they are trying to sell you on whatever they're, they have in that. And they're, they're going to make it sound like it's the most amazing crop in the world. So if you read through this, you know, it's, it sounds like it's the most amazing thing out there because it has rich, complex flavors with hints and a subtle sweetness and, you can use the flowers and you can use the leaves and um, it sounds super sexy, but really that's what it is. Um, it's a dandelion um, and, and that's for sale for $4 and 50 cents for 20 seeds online. So I'm not, I'm a proponent of, of dandelions in, in yards. So I think that they're a great thing to have in the yard, but Again, don't always go off of that seed packet. Don't always go off of um, that catalog because again, they are trying to sell you something. Talk to me, talk to fellow, you know, gardeners, talk to the folks at the nursery, um, you know, hop online, get part of some chat groups or whatever it is because, you know, that local piece to me is the piece that is really key um, when it comes to knowing what you should grow. So we do have cold season crops, uh, and obviously when we live in Colorado, a cool season crop is a really good choice. Um, the vast majority of these crops do really well here. They tend to be shorter in growing season, um, and they can withstand some uh, uh, cold temperatures. So these are our hardy and our semi-hardy vegetables. They can take night temperatures in the 20s. Um, these are those ones that we could really start planting them out now. Uh, peas, we could put peas in the garden in most places and there's going to be someone from purgatory who's going to chime in and say like there's no way and I get it there is no way. Um, but lettuce, spinach, um, throw some radishes out, uh, throw some beet seeds out um, because you are getting to that time where you can start growing these cold season crops and I highly recommend them. I mean, these are those ones that are going to give you success. Uh, these are the ones that are going to um, make you feel more confident. So in next year, you, yeah, that you're going to go back out there and garden again. And then we have our warm season crops. Um, so these are those crops that I don't really want you to put out until uh, the fear of frost is over. Again, we don't know when that fear of that last frost is going to happen. Um, I can tell you I put out tomatoes and peppers well before June 23rd last year. Um, and I got dinged for it. You know, I had a fair number of dead plants that got hit by that frost. Um, but again, most of these plants, actually all of these plants, they're intolerant of a frost. So when it hits 32 degrees, um, you're going to see some, some mortality. Um, it may just be a dying back of uh, a couple leaves um, and maybe the whole plant. Um, and it's also, again, in the fall with the same predicament occurs. Uh, where those cold season crops can withstand some of those temperatures that are in the 20s. Whereas these, you, you have a tomato plant that's full of tomatoes uh, and you leave it out there and it gets to be 28 degrees, uh, you're gonna have a black tomato plant on the next morning. So where do you put your garden? Um, and again, that can be a daunting task and I, you know, each person's garden is gonna be different and each person's space is gonna be different. Um, so where do you wanna put that garden at? excuse me, um, most of our crops are going to require full sun. That's about six to eight hours minimum of sunshine. Um, if you have areas where there's less sunshine, um, there are some crops that can do okay with some shade, especially afternoon shade. Um, lettuce does okay with shade. Um, the uh, onions and garlic can do okay with shade. Carrots will do okay with shade. Um, to me, something like a tomato likes that eight hours of sun, but I'm going to try my hardest to take that 
hot afternoon sun out of the out of the equation for tomatoes. I would love for them to be shaded in the afternoon, um, just because I feel like at our elevation, um, come four o'clock, that's when it gets really hot, and that's when you start to see some of that uh, kind of that scald and um, sunburn on our plants. Um, and we'll go through each some of these a little bit more in detail here in a second. Uh, make sure you're near a water source just because um, it makes it easier on you. Avoid low spots. We say low spots because that tends to be where cold air gets trapped. Um, we don't want cold air being trapped right before dawn for vegetables. Uh, that's the worst thing you could possibly do. Avoid shade. And again, we talked about this, but we don't want to plant underneath the canopy of a tree because you're not going to get your six to eight hours. Avoid windy spots. Um, a lot of our crops get wind damage, especially early in the season. Uh, come June, when you have a squash plant that's growing, um, you know, with significant growth every day, and then you have that pers persistent wind that just desiccates those leaves, it's going to stunt that plant. And then we all talk about fencing as well. So should I fence my garden? Um, and that's the daunting task. Surprisingly enough, fencing is one of those things that probably turns a fair amount of people off when it comes to gardening. Um, just because they don't either like the looks of the fence or the fence is another expense or um, it's a maybe too big, whatever it is. But you know, with wildlife, above and below ground wildlife, we can have challenges. So in terms of sunlight, again, we want that six to eight hours of sunlight. Open gradual slope is best. You know, in an ideal world, you have south facing, shade free. Um, and then when it comes to soil, uh, you know, and, and I've given a number of, of soil talks over the years, but um, yeah, I, uh, I cannot express um, enough how important giving yourself a good soil is. Um, and it's, it's kind of the no brainer where the soil supplies water to the plant roots. Um, and within that water space, it also then will supply nutrients to the plant. Um, and then provide that physical support uh, to the roots. So again, you're, you're doing all these things for the betterment of that plant. Um, and I'm gonna keep repeating this, you are trying to grow a crop in, in 120 days or less. Remember that, 120 days or less, you better have some decent soil or um, you're, you're just gonna be kind of up against that challenge that's gonna drive you crazy. Um, so soils are incredibly important. And, and part of this is, is this organic matter. So, you know, we get a lot of folks who have a clay soil out there. I have a really clay soil. It doesn't drain. I can't get anything to grow. Um, and I get it. That can be a significant challenge. Um, so in the vegetable garden, one of our main goals is to improve that soil structure, right? So we're going to add organic matter. Um, and I think I'll have a slide here talking about what organic matter is here in a second or what you can add, but what it does, so this organic matter breaks down and as it breaks down, it releases these gums, these resins, these sticky substances that cause, you know, what we, we, we create these PEDs. Um, it allows that soil to create this, this aggregate. And with that aggregate, you're kind of getting space in between. So again, I don't know if you can see my hands, but you know, we have this space in between. So this is a ped and this is a ped. We have space that it then allows for water and oxygen and for water to move through that soil profile, which is incredibly important. And then as we add organic, we provide organic matter, we provide that food, which is the base of that soil food web, right? So those things that eat the soil organic matter, and then those things, you know, create those, those small arthropods, insects that um, can then again, create more airspace and pore space, and you get a better soil structure. So one of the biggest challenges we have right now is that our soils remain wet and cold late into the season. Um, a cold soil does not grow plants. It just, it, 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 nothing really happens. Our transplants don't really uh, get growing. Um, our seeds don't germinate. So to me right now, your primary goal, if you have an existing garden, um, is to get it to dry out. Uh, if you can get it to dry out, you're gonna be ahead of the game. Um, because that, again, that, that poorly drained soil is gonna make it harder to grow. And then 
during the growing season, maybe one day we'll get another, you know, monsoon rain that rolls through. Um, we want that soil to, we want it to drain through. We want that water to push through that soil profile, wet the roots, fill those spaces, but then get out of there. Um, if you have a clay soil, sometimes that water can remain for days and that's not what we want. Plants need oxygen, water, and nutrients, those three things. If those pore spaces fill with just water, then they won't have oxygen and they won't grow. So one of the things that we'll talk about today and one of the things that I cannot profess enough how much I love them are raised beds. Um, raised beds, then as you raise that soil, you increase the drainage. Okay, so it's a pretty simple equation. The higher the soil, the faster the drainage. So if we can raise our soils eight inches, 10 inches, um, that, that water is going to push through that soil faster. So again, we want this because then our soils will heat up quickly. Our soils are going to put almost all of their energy into drying themselves before they warm themselves. We want that soil to dry itself before it warms itself. And again, by doing that, maybe it's black plastic on top of it. Maybe it's, um, you know, raising that bed. Maybe it's adding organic matter. All of those things or get your, is going to, they're, they're going to get your soil to dry quicker. Um, and then invest in some sort of thermometer, right? So just a, a digital meat thermometer is a great investment for a gardener. Um, because I want you to take soil temperatures. Um, and you can take soil temperatures and, and then look online. And I, I don't know if, I don't think I have it in this presentation, but there's a soil germination chart for vegetables out there. Um, the UC Davis folks did it years ago. Uh, and it's by far my favorite resource right now because it gives the minimum temperature that all of our vegetable crops will germinate at. And it also gives how long it takes for them to germinate at different temperatures. So again, your temperature soil may be 40 degrees right now. And you're going to throw a crop out there that um, maybe the, uh, the, you know, the minimum soil temperature is going to be 40, but it's going to take 15 to 20 days. Now, if you can raise that temperature to 50 to 60, um, it's going to take a shorter amount of time um, for that seed to germinate. Um, so again, I just, I cannot uh, um, profess this soil temperature. Just give that meat thermometer. Um, there's no need to put your squash seeds out when the soil temperatures are 60 degrees, okay? Just don't do it because that seed's going to sit there. It's not going to germinate. Um, and then you're going to blame the seed company. Um, but really, it's going to be you because that soil sat there, it rotted, an earwig found it, a centipede, millipede found it, whatever it is. So again, just hold off. Hold off until those soil temperatures are at their optimal numbers. And then just like if you think of the bed mixture. So it, it, this is about as anecdotal as you can get. Um, but there is this raised bed mix. This is kind of like my ratio. If I were to build a raised bed um, and add soil to it, this would be kind of the, uh, that number. You know, it'd be about four inches of existing soil. I love our native soils. I love clay soils because they hold nutrients. They have a lot of nutrient holding capacity. Um, so I'll have about four inches of existing soil, three inches of topsoil. Now, where do you find that topsoil? That can be a little bit more of our challenge. Um, there's, you know, topsoil, at least around here in La Plata County, can be incredibly variable. And I, that's just a bummer. I'm sorry. Um, but you can go to our local nurseries. I would highly recommend a local nursery over a box store. Um, so you go to the local nurseries or call them right now and talk to them about topsoil. And then they have, you know, both of the local nurseries here in Durango at least have a topsoil with soil amendment already mixed in. So it has those two things as a bulk soil. Um, so those are kind of my numbers there. And I want to make sure that you mix all of that stuff together. Don't layer it like, like lasagna. Um, mix it like soup, okay? So you're going to be mixing all of this stuff together um, because water doesn't like to have this variability. If you have four inches of your existing soil on the bottom and then three inches of topsoil right on top of it, that water is not going to want to travel down from that topsoil and, and then through that existing soil. It's going to go down, hit that existing soil, and move out. 
okay? And in a raised bed, you're trapping that water and you'll have what's called a perched water table. <laughs> um, the one on the upper left is not one that I'm recommending or not recommending. It's from a, a Colorado company called Paonia Soil Company, I think is what it's called. Um, and they make this vegetable bed mix. <clears throat> um, it's a good combination. I would just always recommend mixing this with our native soils. Um, our native soils are good vegetable growing soils, I promise you. Um, they just need to be amended. They have to have some organic matter added to them. And then fencing, right? Like we wanna keep <clears throat> all of our four-legged friends out of our garden, um, and that can be a challenge. Um, for sure. Our recommendation is an eight foot tall fence um, for above ground. Um, there are some folks out there who are doing a four foot tall fence and then they have like a fishing line or a monofilament um, about a foot higher, like a colored monofilament um, as a detractant um, to deer. Um, but again, that how tall the fence is can be an eyesore for some folks. <clears throat> but maybe you don't have deer and, and wildlife issues. Maybe you don't have rabbits or unruly neighbors, whatever it is. But I think the majority of us have something that walks through our property on a, on a weekly basis. But then don't forget those things that are below ground, um, pocket gophers. Uh, I think I've had more pocket gopher calls in these last couple of days than anything else because the pocket gophers are either the snow is melting and people are seeing the damage they've done um, or they're just uh, being active right now. So we do recommend fencing below ground if you have issues with pocket gophers. <clears throat> Excuse me, you can, uh, we recommend it's called a, a galvanized hardware cloth with small mesh, like a quarter to half inch squares. And you wanna bury that about 18 inches deep. You can bury it at the same perimeter as your fence. Um, but again, I'm, people don't like it when I tell them they have to trench um, because it's a lot of work in our clay and rocky soils. If you do have raised beds, you can attach this uh, hardware cloth to the, the bottom of the raised bed. Um, so the, the pocket gophers, voles, prairie dogs can't come up into your raised beds. So that is a kind of a nice trick as well. Uh, and then competition, quick slide, you know, a tree is going to outcompete uh, an onion. I can tell you that um, seven days of the week. They're just going to continually outcompete them. So try to reduce that competition when it comes to placing your garden. And then also water. I could do a whole class on irrigation. It's one of my favorite things to teach and do is to install irrigation. But, you know, for water, it comes to us in many different ways. It comes from a Spick it on the side of the house. We may get it from a ditch. We may get it from a retention or detention pond. Um, we may get it from a well. Who knows where we're getting that water? Uh, but we do have to think about water efficiency in the vegetable garden. I can, I'm sorry to break it to you, but vegetables are not xeric. They're not water wise. They are water hogs. Because again, as a reminder, we're trying to grow these crops in less than 120 days um, and give us some sort of large leaf or a fruit or whatever it is. So, um, it is a challenge um, when it comes to watering. So think about some of those efficient techniques, drip irrigation, uh, soaker hoses. You know, if you have an irrigation system at the house, dedicate an own valve just to um, uh, the vegetable garden um, because the requirements for that vegetable crops are gonna be very different than your lawn or your ornamental beds. Um, if you do have any other questions on irrigation, Again, feel free to shoot me an email, phone call, call Grand Junction Pipe here in Durango, and they're all across the western part of the state. Um, they're also a great resource when it comes to helping you design an irrigation system. And again, just remember that, you know, we are watering in a dry land, so we may have to make some choices. So certain plants do require a lot of water. Um, potatoes require a lot of water. Corn can require a lot of water. Um, tomatoes, uh, broccoli, uh, some of our winter squash can. So what are you gonna sacrifice out of that garden? If you know your pond's not gonna fill, if you know you're only getting irrigation once a week um, off the ditch, then some sacrifices will be made. You know, I can tell you again, beans, they're a hog. When it comes to setting uh, fruit, they may require, you know, a, a fair amount of water. And if you're not able to give that bean, 
you know, that quarter of an inch per day, then maybe you're not going to be growing um, fresh green beans. If you are thinking about when to water, just know you're going to do it maybe kind of at these critical periods. So for us, you know, the critical periods are the few, few the first few weeks of development. June is a rough month in Southwest Colorado. Temperatures are high and water is low. Um, but, and so this is when we're trying to get plants started and getting transplants to establish, and it can be a challenge. So immediately after transplanting and then during flowering and fruit production are all those critical periods. Okay, so bed design. What does it look like? Again, I like red raised beds. Uh, uh, I'm a big fan of them. I, I think that they serve us well. They can be sometimes daunting to make, um, but don't overthink it. You know, use rocks, use some stones, use um, concrete blocks, um, find something to recycle, use bricks. I would just tell you, don't use treated wood uh, and don't use railroad ties. Those are those two things that do potentially release some heavy metals um, and we don't want those in the garden. Um, I do feel like, you know, the raised bed is easier to maintain. I don't till very much in my garden. Um, I just have a small little battery packed tiller that just kind of mixes stuff up in the springtime and in the fall, but that's it. Um, I, like we mentioned before, promotes drainage, which then promotes those warming temperatures. Um, you know, we see a lot of these now that are elevated high enough. We have a community garden here in Durango, uh, the Ohana Kuleana, and they have a raised bed there that um, is at kind of hip height, counter height, which is fantastic uh, for people who are in wheelchairs or you know, even some of us who bending down and getting on our knees can be painful and can be a challenge. So raising them up um, can be really beneficial. What science has kind of shown us is with raised beds, we do see higher yields. Um, we can get in there a little earlier because those soils are warmer. Uh, if you have some sort of frost protection like hoops or frost cloth, uh, they can easily attach to the sides of those raised beds. Um, and then again, that soil improvement. So continually adding organic matter is going to be a key part of this. So you're going to want to add it um, almost every every year. Simple design, four by eight, right? Just we do a four by eight bed because you could kind of reach across that bed from either side. It's one cut of dimensional lumber, so fewer times to screw up. Um, the size of if you do use lumber, uh, I'd recommend either a two by twelve or a two by ten. When we come to like how we plant the raised beds or even how you plant your traditional beds in the garden, uh, I like this, what we call this block style layout. Um, again, similar to raised beds, we see this improved soils because we don't have a lot of erosion with these block styles. Um, this works better with our close seeded crops. So think of um, carrots, think of lettuce, uh, think of maybe peas, Swiss chard, kale, those things. Don't think of this for tomatoes or squash. Okay, squash are not a close row block style layout. You have to give squash plenty of room to run. And it's similar to what we call the square fit gardening. So it's, everything's planted on a grid or on a square. So it's a one foot square. <clears throat> um, this is how I, I really like to plant in the square foot gardening style. Um, everything kind of has that same spacing as it would be on the back of the seed packet. Um, so if you see that one on the upper left, you know, let's say that's a three inch spacing for carrots. Um, so within one square foot, uh, you could put 16 carrots in there. So again, it's what we call this close row uh, or block style planting. Um, and I really like it. It's something you can Google square foot gardening. You'll find plenty of it online. Um, but I've seen great results. Uh, again, bed size, I do four foot long, um, and I'm sorry, eight foot long and four foot wide. You can put a grid on top of that if it helps you. Um, but know that within each square, you'd probably grow one, four, nine, 16, or uh, even 24 or 32 plants for that one square foot. <clears throat> uh, this is what I use to do it. So I don't do the grid. I use this as called a double board. Um, I used to, on these slides, I used to have this link to make your own double board. Um, but then when I actually clicked on the link this year, it took me to some person selling goat soap. Um, so I feel like that link is no longer about a devil board, but they're really easy to make. I'm gonna try to do a video here this week or next on how to make a devil board and, and put it up on the extension website and the grow and give website. 
But again, this is it, kind of every hole is equally spaced. You just press down um, and every hole is the same depth. So for someone like me who is relatively OCD in the garden, this is a really beneficial tool. Um, and then again, just these last couple of slides. So we're gonna end here, we'll end on these last couple of slides and then I'm gonna try to work that chat box and try to answer as many questions as I can. Um, and then you can also raise your hand. Again, this will be recorded or it is being recorded. So if you need to check it um, in a couple of days, you're more than welcome. But, <clears throat> you know, especially right now where we find ourselves cooped up in houses and, and apartments and sometimes feeling alone. Um, being outside is is really beneficial. And I say that and you can hear the allergies in my voice because the winds never stop blowing um, for this past week or so here in Durango, it seems like. Um, but get outside and, you know, and get into that garden because, you know, as Al Siebel mentioned and said here, you know, it's a place where I can find myself when I need to lose myself. Um, and to me, I, I cannot reiterate that enough. So our days are stressful. Um, the news right now is not always that positive. <clears throat> but again, to be able to go out into a garden, um, you know, grab your favorite drink, grab your favorite tool, um, maybe grab your favorite person who you're not in quarantine with, um, and just enjoy that space um, can go a long way for sure. Um, so there's my contact information. Uh, again, my name is Darren Parmenter. I'm down here in La Plata County. So my email is darren.parmenter at colostate.edu, uh, or you can look us up online at laplataextension.org. Um, and I'm gonna say at the end of this presentation, we are a research institution that likes to validate what we do. I'm gonna try a poll. So if you all could hang till the end, I would so appreciate just being able to try to do this poll. Maybe I'll do it before the Q&A so I don't lose everybody. Um, but here's our grow and give too. Uh, so again, we're calling this this grow and give project. Uh, we're really excited about it. I know there's videos up there now on soil temperature. I just did some presentation that was made into a YouTube on soil temperature and planting. There's stuff on seed planting, um, planting peas, planting potatoes. All of our fact sheets, all of our plant talks are all on there. Um, so it's a great website and it's something that's being shared uh, throughout the country right now. So I'm gonna start this, poll. I'm gonna see if I can do a poll. I'm gonna launch polling. Okay, are you guys seeing the poll? Hopefully so, so I don't know. Um, I just wanna make sure that you're able to apply this information. Um, that's kind of important to us to be able to validate what we do here. Um, and then number two is Zoom, an acceptable way, and I'm gonna stress acceptable. Um, again, I am sitting here in my office space. Um, I don't think this is the most acceptable way for me to give a talk. I love interaction with humans. Um, and then that last question is, do you live in Southwest Colorado? Just kind of, kind of know where folks are coming from. Uh, and again, so if people are coming from further away, then we can tailor this presentation for, for folks who are um, not as close as, as everybody else. So I'm gonna give this maybe about 10 more seconds. Um, and uh, I'm also gonna take a picture of it. So if you see me with my phone, it's because I don't trust technology. So I gotta validate to my bosses that I actually gave this talk and that I wasn't drinking tequila while doing it. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and end it. So thank you all for taking that poll. So I appreciate that. Um, okay, so I'm gonna open up for um, questions. I'm gonna say you can unmute yourself now. You all did really good. Um, but that's just because I muted you all and you didn't have a choice in the matter. Um, so I'm just gonna kind of uh, read through these classes. Um, these classes. I'm on, I gotta get rid of this thing. Okay. Um, sorry, this stuff's getting entered and then it disappears. Um, would you recommend that barrier underneath raised beds? Um, again, so if I I would if you have already installed the raised if you have not installed the raised bed, 
if you have installed that raised bed, it sure is going to be a challenge for you to pull that up and then put some of that hardware cloth underneath it um, and then try to put that back down. It just won't happen. Um, so if you're not worried about it, then don't worry about a barrier at all. There's no reason to put a weed cloth under there. Um, there's no reason to put much of a barrier. If you're just installing beds now, um, what some folks will do is they'll uh, have that existing soil that's underneath the bed. They'll mix it with some of that native soil or some of the soil that you add. Um, and then you can put down um, some layers of newspaper as a weed inhibitor. Um, that'll help for a couple of years. For most weeds, that said, if you have bindweed, if you have mallow, um, they will find a way through that, no problem. If you have some of our invasives, they will find a way or way through that, no problem. So again, don't think that's gonna create, I, to me it's more of a hassle than a help. Um, I also don't mind weeding. Um, it's something for me to kind of get some relaxation in the garden. Um, okay, I'm going to start at the top real quick. And then some are just comments, so maybe quick. Um, I'm glad to see people are eating dinner while they're doing this talk. Um, Rose has been eating dinner for the entire thing. So thank you, Rose, for sharing your food. I expect a care package in the next day or two. Um, sorry, keep coming down through tilling or non-tilling. Um, again, I'm not a huge tillage fan with clay soils. There is a small window when we can till. Um, and that window is it really, is kind of like right now, if that, um, you till a really wet clay soil, you will get Adobe brick. Uh, you till a really dry soil and especially with our wind, that organic matter gets into the air, the wind pulls that organic matter off, and you lose what is so valuable. So I'm okay tilling in the spring to incorporate soil amendments, to incorporate whatever we added in uh, the fall. I'm fine with that, that's okay. Um, but just to till for the sake of tilling, I tend to not recommend it. With tillage, you are constantly breaking up soil structure. So we are trying to build soil structure, build larger peds so we have that space in between. When you till, you destroy that soil structure. So that's probably my least, um, it's not some my least favorite thing to do because I do it. I just don't want you to over till. That's probably my least favorite thing to do. Um, let me keep going through here. I live up here in DW2, so that's Durango West 2. What grows well up here since we were another 1,000 feet up? This is my first garden ever. Awesome. Good job, Phil. So really what you can grow up there is the same stuff we can grow down here um, at 6,500. You're just going to be later. Um, I tend to think, so if I'm going to grow, so, okay, we like tomatoes, right? Everybody likes a tomato in their garden. For some reason, we have to have tomatoes in our garden. If you're at our elevation or higher, think about what tomatoes you're gonna grow. Let's not grow these big indeterminate heirloom tomatoes with one pound fruit because your success rate may be, may be less. Um, what I would say is you grow smaller fruit. You grow uh, cherry tomatoes, plum tomatoes, sun goals are fantastic. You grow indeterminate tomatoes. So those are tomatoes that put on a certain amount of vegetative growth. Uh, some mechanisms in the plant switch to go from vegetative to re reproductive and they put a heavy load of, of tomatoes on all at once. They tend to be shorter season. So they're, instead of a 90 day tomato, there may be a 65 day tomato. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And then look at those cold season crops. Those are great. So broccoli, a cabbage, chard, kale. Kale does wonderful in Southwest Colorado. Peas. Um, beans are relatively short uh, season, so growing beans uh, are, you know, is super effective. Um, so again, almost all of those things will work for you. You're going to have to be the judge, okay? You're going to be able to say, I can't grow these. You probably are not going to grow a bell pepper, a DW2, with continued success year after year. But you could probably grow a shishito pepper. You could grow a jalapeno pepper because they're smaller um, and they'll, they're more uh, productive than some of our bigger, uh, you know, pepper crops. So just think small. Um, so Deb Paulson added, try glacier tomatoes for short season areas. 
awesome. Anything that has the word like glacier or Iceland or ice or Siberian, those are good things for Southwest Colorado, right? Like don't think about some of these things that you can grow in the South. Think about things you can grow here in, in, um, in Colorado. Uh, Stacy asked when making a raised bed, would missing native soil and aged compost be a good soil for garden? Yep. Again, so one of the things you can do, if you don't know what your garden is or what your soil is going to be, um, do a soil test. We have those soil containers at the extension office. Um, our extension office is closed, so you cannot get a soil container. But just grab a Tupperware, grab a baggie, a Ziploc baggie, um, and take 15 samples from across the garden space, mix them together, subsample out, put in that Tupperware bag, and then get online to CSU Soil uh, Diagnostic Lab. And you can do a soil test for 35 bucks. And it'll give you a good idea what your soil organic matter is, what your pH is, uh, what your soil salts are like. We don't like a lot of salts when it comes to the vegetable garden. And they can be a little daunting. Um, so just take that and, and send it to me. And I'll walk you through the soil test, no problem. Um, so that's just the soils lab at CSU. Turnaround right now was probably two weeks. Um, it can be... Um, a little bit slow, especially in this day and age when um, CSU staff are limited, but it's really the best place to, to start. Um, okay, so I'm at 735, so I've gone over my hour, go figure, I like to talk. Is there anybody who wants to ask a question? This is always that danger zone with Zoom because six people are going to ask and then you're going to talk over each other and it's not going to get anywhere. So if you do have a question, let's just work through that real quick and you can do it and just unmute yourself, I think. All right. You quiet gardeners. That works fine for me. Um, okay. So I'm not... Oh, sorry, you can't unmute. Oh, there you go. Allow participants to unmute themselves. So how, how much can you get by using a hoop garden? Much better is having a greenhouse. Okay, so the question is, a hoop house, just a simple hoop house or a greenhouse. Um, for Southwest Colorado, I'm all about using the hoop houses. I'm all about using a hoop. So to me, with a raised bed, what I've always done is, and I wish I had a, a slide on here, but I'm going to try to just describe it to you and you can write it down. Um, grab a half inch conduit or irrigation tubing um, or PVC. Um, and that's going to become the rib of your hoop, you know, so... You take that and then you just put rebar on either side of the bed, drill it into the ground a little bit, and that conduit or that PVC or irrigation just slides right on one side, slides on the other side, and you create a rib. You do five of these across a four by eight bed, and then that will allow you to put frost cloth over that. It'll allow you to put multiple layers of frost cloth or blankets on top of it just to give yourself some protection. So. Um, and that's going to cost you all of 20 bucks to do that for one bed. Uh, greenhouses are, are entirely different type of production mechanisms. Um, and our challenge sometimes here is in the middle of summer, greenhouses just get too hot. Uh, we can get up in over 120 to 130 degrees in the middle of summer in a greenhouse without proper ventilation. And crops don't like it that hot. So um, what I'm pushing for are you know, 10 to 14 days on the beginning of the season and 10 to 14 days on the end of the season. And that little hoop over your raised bed or over your garden bed can give you that because frost cloth can give you anywhere between two to six degrees of, of frost protection. Um, if you get fancy, you can do two layers of plastic, one on the inside of the hoop and one on the outside of the hoop. That plastic with that thermal uh, inch in between that air mass in between those two layers of plastic can give you about 10 to 12 degrees of protection. Um, CSU, if you go on to CSU online, just Google CSU extension, 
season extension. And they've got these old school ways of taking your hoop on top of your raised bed and putting those old school Christmas lights inside. Um, that the big ones, so like this big, they're called C75s. Um, I just call them 1970 lights. Uh, but they put off a lot of heat. Don't use LEDs because they don't put off heat. So you can string, you know, lights inside of that and then put a frost blink. I mean, you can go all out with this stuff and get about 20 to 25 degrees of protection. Um, and to me, that's enough to get you that extra two weeks on either side. Hey, Darren, this is Melissa. Melissa. I was I was wondering if there's like an affordable way to to um, filter my irrigation water so that I can use soaker hoses. Oh, I wish I could tell you there's a I mean, affordable would be just your husband's crafty. Have him dig a pond, line the pond. And then, uh, then that stuff will settle out and you're pumping off the top. That said, not everybody can do that. And I'm doubting you can't really just dig an extra pond. Well, we have, I mean, we have, we have the pond, we have the pump. We just, it's not lined in the ducks and the uh, things will be in the pond. So, yeah. Yeah, you can do, I mean, I can tell you that you can do like a green sand filter, but then that removes the affordability piece out of the equation. Green sand filters are pretty expensive. Um, you know, to me, typically just letting things settle, um, can be the best idea to try to get to use soaker hose. <clears throat> but, it, and again, Melissa, here's the thing, like, I don't want you to get pissed at that irrigation system. So you may not be able to, uh, you may not be able to go ahead and do that. You may have to use typical overhead irrigation or hose irrigation. Um, and that may just be like the, the way that it works because soaker hoses will clog. Drip irrigation will clog with just a little bit of sediment. Um, but again, and so I think, um, so there are some suggestions over here. See, this is why I love gardeners. To make your own screen filters, go from mesh down to pantyhose. We're getting homestead quality stuff here now. That's awesome. Uh, ditch water go into a rain barrel, then pump it from the top. Um, so there are some ideas. Those are both good ideas. Um, but typically, if, if something is going to clog a soaker hose, it, ha it can still be pretty fine. Um, drip irrigation is going to be a little bit bigger, so you may get away with a little bit more variability with that. Other questions? Now that you can unmute yourself. Side note question, Darren. This is Krista. Hey. Um, hey. Uh, I'm just wondering, is there any um, option to have anybody look at tree, like fruit bearing trees, um, either while you guys are closed or in the future? So are you asking if someone can come look at them for, are they on your property or to buy them? <laughs> no, we have some, but we also want to plant others. And um, so the, we've, we have the ones we have kind of need some help. They're old and um, okay. we aren't sure how to, how, to, how to make sure that we maintain them. Okay. Um, ones that we currently have as well. So offline, I'll go, and I'm still doing, and again, this world of phones allows me to do site visits remotely. Um, so what I would say is offline, I'll give you my cell phone number um, and just shoot me photos um, of the trees that are in question. And, and then just, uh, and I'll get your number from Beth. Um, but then we'll just, and I can give you some ideas on some new plant, some trees that you could put in. Um, and we should do this again for uh, fruit bearing crops. Um, again, apples, pears, plums, um, all do fantastic in, in this neck of the woods. Perfect, thank you. Yep. I've got a question for you about raised beds. Okay. Um, I, over the last few years, have decided to kind of do more like waffle gardening in my bed where I've actually, in my garden where we actually have kind of sunken beds from the perspective of trying to actually retain water um, longer after a storm or longer after I, the sprinkler hits it. Right. And so I guess I was curious, are you kind of uh, 
religiously into the raised beds or there's sometimes where you find them appropriate to actually do sunken beds uh, if your soil is well drained enough. Yeah, if you have a well drained soil, then that sunken bed will definitely work. Um, and it actually holds that heat a little bit better too because you have the, the thermal mass um, of this, the existing soil around the bed. Um, there's just not too many soils around here that are able to do that. And I know like the waffle garden is more of a permaculture approach to collecting the water that uh, may come off the, the soil surface. Um, and I think it's a fantastic idea. Uh, I, again, if it works for you where you feel like you can get early season growth, um, then I say by all means go for it, you know, go underneath the ground, go below ground. Um, and then utilize it for sure. I have no problem with it. Thanks. Any other questions? Cool. Darren, All right. Oh, Darren, Deb. can I just can I just mention that I I think Rachel Landis with the Good Food Collective wanted people to know that they're going to be starting some sharing of resources. Do you, did you see that email, Darren, and know I, any detail about it? Or? I did see the email. I just had a couple questions on what they're actually supplying. So that was just, right. and I never got a, a word back. Right. Um, so I know the Good Food Collective here in Southwest Colorado is working with the Garden Project of Southwest Colorado, I think, um, and also Manus Soup Kitchen to, and Pine River Shares out of Bayfield. Mm -hmm. That's who it was, um, to essentially get uh, small raised beds to people who need them. Um, so I'm assuming they're made out of probably cedar or some sort of dimensional lumber. Um, but I would just probably go on to the Good Food Collective website um, right. and see what they I, have to offer. Hey Darren. I think they're just getting it going. Okay. Hey, hey Darren, I'm so sorry to interrupt. Oh, this there is she is. Hi, this is Hallie hey. Leganza. <laughs> I'm the AmeriCorps VISTA with the Good Food Collective, so I'm helping working on this project. Um, we are currently in the ideation phase, so we're getting some details hammered out, um, but we do have a connection to soil, um, some resources on um, foodisfree.org to try to figure out the cheapest, safest way to build um, raised beds, and we're hoping to put kits together so that people who maybe are interested in starting their own garden for an affordable price, can come pick up a kit, and that would include things like seedlings. So it's still very much in the startup phase, but um, if you guys are interested, for sure, keep an ear out. Thanks. Awesome. So, Holly, thank you. So another question, what about using a tiny heater, like I have a little four by four inch heater, or a light bulb in a hoop bed or a uh, cold frame? Sure. Uh, we tend to... Um, if I take off my CSU sweatshirt, I could tell you that's a great idea. We always, we know when it comes to electricity and, and uh, heat or puts out a fair amount of BTUs. Um, so we just want you to be very careful whenever using a heater, especially a heater outdoors. Um, but it'll, that would put off a lot of heat for sure. Um, it's just retaining that heat. And so if you can close it, uh, if you can, again, put some sort of cover over the top of that, that would go a no, long they're way. Covered. Yeah. Yeah, and again, so tonight and last night was really cold. Um, tonight is going to be really cold for folks. Uh, we're talking down in the teens and potentially lower in other places. Um, that's, those are cold nights. Um, so you, some folks will just have to, like, you take that risk. Um, uh, small heaters could work if you have fruit trees that are pushing blossoms right now. Um, stringing those trees with Christmas lights, putting small heaters underneath those trees can help for a little while, um, but there is nothing like April and May in Southwest Colorado to kill a gardener. Somebody asked, what's your favorite way to kill the grass below a raised bed? Spade <laughs> shovel. Just take your spade shovel, go about two inches below ground, go horizontally, cut that root mass out of there. Um, if you have time, flip it, so flip it over. Um, and then let that grass decompose and it just provides organic matter back into the beds. So to me, that's the easiest way. Uh, you can go the, or the herbicide route, but um, we'll stick with the shovel. It's good exercise. Can I just mention that uh, the, the Grange is planning to have two more Zoom 
presentations. We don't have the dates nailed down yet, but within the next, by the end of May, we plan to have one on native plants and then one on water quality and the animus uh, drainage and that sort of thing. So awesome. we'll be looking for those on Facebook, on our Facebook page. Okay, so with that, I'm gonna go ahead and click off. There's 46 people still left. Thank you all for being part of this. Um, Thank you, Darren. Yeah, this is fun. Um, I like talking, um, just not to the same people for the last 17 days. Um, so again, like having this human interaction is, kind of, is awesome. Seeing smiling faces is awesome. Seeing faces that I haven't seen for a while is awesome. I'm just gonna tell you all to be safe, uh, wash your hands, um, and, and get out there and garden because it is a really fun thing to do. Thanks, Darren. This was great. See y'all. Take care. Bye.